Tom, are you okay? I lost her. Her? She was going to be this epic, trilogy-worthy character. I was going to be the hottest writer in Hollywood. But I can't get past Act 1! You need some writer's group therapy. Hello, and welcome to Writer's Group Therapy. I'm Tom. And I'm Roshni. We're writers helping writers. Are you ready for your session? The doctors are in. And if you like what you hear, make sure you subscribe, share it with your friends, give us a five-star rating on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can find us online at writersgrouptherapy.com, also on Twitter and Instagram at WG Therapy. Individually, I'm Tom underscore Loveman on Twitter and Tom Loveman on Instagram. And I am at Roshni Lamino on Twitter and at Moon Lily Music on Instagram. And today we have a very special guest because she's my agent. Oh my gosh. <laughs> we have with us Julia Erzik, who is the owner and head agent at the Library Agency, which is a boutique agency here in Los Angeles. She's also a lawyer. So yeah, pretty darn cool. Julia, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's my pleasure. Woohoo! So you have several divisions in your uh, agency, theatrical, commercial, voiceover, and then what we're going to be hitting on a bit here, literary, and then of course, children, but we won't be talking about them. But we're Good. mostly interested in what's going on in the world today in regards to writers. Sure. Uh, we have a thriving literary division um, headed by myself and Diane Wang. Uh, we're WGA uh, franchised as well as SAG franchise, and we are very interested in helping writers develop and get started in their careers. That's really cool. Um, A lot of our listeners are uh, aspiring writers or writers that are struggling to to get that first thing out. For those kinds of writers, um, what what kind of of, uh, projects are you looking for? Are you looking for projects to package with your talent or are you just looking for you know new voices uh what are the what are the mandates out there these days that you're seeing with the changes in the environment and the culture and stuff we don't do packaging we're signatories to the wga guidelines so we are a non-packaging uh, agency um so uh, i think that's a first priority and what we've been seeing the trend toward is more animated uh, features, series, etc. Uh, animation because it's you know safer for everyone involved in this COVID world. Cool. Do you notice that the volume of of requests you're looking at or the uh, are up down? Where were they pre pandemic versus now? That kind of thing. I have been get noticing more phone calls um, lately from writers. We always received a high volume of submissions, but. In the last three or four months, when people have had more time to work on their writing projects, we've been getting a large volume of writers calling um, and sending us their materials since uh, we first locked down in March. Is this even a good time, though, to be going after representation? It depends. Um, If you have a, a really great script or a uh, novel or screenplay or you know show then absolutely we're still signing writers and we're still pitching work but it, things are getting made less it, it, the more complex the more characters the more uh, in depth it is so we've seen a lot of more move ahead on our animated series and scripts than we saw, uh, than we've seen on our non-animated recently, um, but being inundated with writers definitely means that the competitiveness is higher. Yeah, so that makes sense. I mean, so I know how pilot season works for actors and like the timing of it, but I'm not really sure how it works for writers. Has that changed as well? Because wouldn't people be pitching right now for series? For writing yes, and stuff? We've been, we've been pitching. We have two series that we're pitching right now. Um, one is in the pitching to networks develop, and one is in development. So um, the timing has definitely been thrown off. Um, and what we found is a lot of times 
even if something gets picked up and there's interest in a COVID world, once you start, if one person tests positive on a project, you have to shut the whole thing down. So the fewer people you have involved in, in an onset project, the more likely it's going to go ahead. So a lot of things that were in development before have been shelved and a lot of um, new things have been picked up instead. So it, the traditional seasons have been sort of not abandoned, but modified. We're, we're, we're not going to have the, the strong delineation of, okay, January to April is uh, pilot season and episodic is, you know, it, it's not as clean like that as it used to be. Do you think with the, um, uh, with the pandemic and everything that there's a change in, um, what the networks are going to be uh, producing? Obviously there's some of them are still trying to finish their seasons from last year. And then going forward, do you see them actually, you know, uh, ordering as many pilots or are they going to be kind of like, we're not going to bother with having pilots made. We're going to go straight to series on stuff. We're just going to pick up, you know, shows from established writers that we know versus looking at newer things, to newer be, writers. To be honest, I don't know if it's too early to know yet. Um, I, I think it may be a little early to know what their plan is because they're modifying and rolling with the punches. Um we are still seeing shows pick back up from the break that everyone took in March. And we are seeing, um, a lot of the issues. Um, sorry, someone was calling me, uh, from Nebraska and I don't know anyone in Nebraska. And my money says that's a, an a, a writer calling to find out where to send their script. I get a dozen of those calls a day. Oh, because yes. my the office phone number forwards to my cell phone uh, when we're not in the office, and the WGA has listed our, that phone number on their website. Um. So, but that leads into my next piece of advice, which is do your research on your the agency that you're interested in. Don't just blanket call or blanket submit to everybody, because if the people that are calling me had done. I don't know, two minutes of research, they'd see there's a way to submit on our website. And yeah, don't make it more difficult than it needs to be. Yes. It, it tells me that you've done no research, uh, which isn't particularly flattering. No, no. Always do your research. For writers who are trying to write stories like set today in our world, are you seeing that anyone's receptive to stories that kind of either address COVID or how are the people addressing COVID in their stories? Are people pretending like it doesn't exist? Or are they skipping to down the road where it's over? Um, there are two approaches I've been seeing mainly. One is love stories set in COVID. Um, you know, couples that met either right before the pandemic started or met online and they're having their whole relationship via Zoom without having met in person. And some of those stories are really well done and interesting, but it can also be uh, very impersonal. The other thing is we, let me get to the other, I, I tend to do this thing where I digress and then forget what my other point was. Um, the other one is taking it to the sort of zombie apocalypse level. COVID has spiraled out of control and everyone's locked in their houses and the infected are coming for you. Um, it's sort of a, you know, Dawn of the Dead sort of concept. And either one is fine, but I, I mean, they're obviously very different stories. But what I caution people, writers about is, it is incredibly stressful for all of us, all of us living in this COVID world and navigating it and we enjoy media to escape and so media that is just as stressful as our own lives is not an escape i'm not saying you can't write it but i'm saying if you're going to write something that will make stressed out people feel as stressed out as they are you you need to approach it in a clever or unusual or interesting way 
just saying it's all sucks. We know it all sucks. We are living in the suck right now. Absolutely. We definitely understand that. The next six to 12 months, like the next year, do you see uh, the streamers being much stronger, you know, targets for uh, writers? Do you see, um, you know, because they've they've done really well with their, you know, like Netflix with its huge, you know, uh, volume of production it's doing. Uh, do you see them being really strong players with all the all the studios and networks and going to the streaming route? Yes, I, I absolutely see streaming services um, as the next powerhouse sort of in the way that in the 90s, HBO became sort of the next big thing. This streaming services are the next big thing. You know, Disney Plus and Hulu and Amazon Prime now has shows and and movies and Netflix has an enormous studio. Uh, and I just think that's going to continue. When you allow people to target the type of t- shows and material they want to watch, uh, and and create streaming platforms focused on that, like Shutter um, does for horror. People will find their genre and be very supportive of that. And I think that's the wave of the future, which is it's it's almost like customized channels. Now, kind of taking the conversation in a different turn here. So the Library Agency is a boutique agency. Um, you know, I've never actually asked you. I don't know if I'm allowed to. How many clients you have on your roster? <laughs> sure. No, you can ask that. Um, okay. Uh, f- total for all departments, including literary, I think we have four hundred. Okay, um, four hundred, which is incredibly small, be- okay. considering we have adult commercial, adult theatrical, kids commercial, kids theatrical, voiceover, uh, adult only voiceover. Uh, we do rep some of our kids for voiceover, but we don't have a kids specific voiceover uh, mm-hmm. and and writers. Um, mm-hmm. Is most, that by design? It is by design. Most agencies have. 400 to 700 clients per agent per department obviously not writers most writer uh, literary agents have you know 20 to 30 clients we have about mm. 30 literary clients um but the the thing that i i was an actor before i was an agent i was an actor actually and then i was in casting and then i was an agent so i've been on all three sides of this the thing i hated um as an actor was cat was uh, agencies that had enormous rosters that threw spaghetti at the wall and hoped someone would stick and they didn't know their actors they didn't care particularly and and I'm not, I'm not saying that about my personal agent when I was an actor I'm just saying in general the industry was an agency had 3000 clients and they just you know would check the box that said females 25 to 35 and then click submit all we don't do that we know our clients super well um you know i have or i used to have i will not i do not have now obviously um open houses for our clients um and when people would walk through the door i knew who everyone was if i didn't it me- meant you need new headshots cuz you don't look like your headshots anymore um, and in, when you're in a large agency, you, you just can't know your clients that well. The personal touch isn't there. Yeah, which is one thing I've really appreciated. Uh, so full disclosure, I've been with the library agency since December of 2019. I do remember those open houses. That was a really nice way to get to meet people. And I'd be curious, you've helmed your ship very well during the pandemic. Thank you. But I know a lot of agencies, especially the bigger ones, are folding and laying off agents and all this stuff. So what, I mean, without giving away too many trade secrets, what <laughs> do you think is going to be the future as far as the Hollywood layout of the agencies? Well, um, there are a couple of things that have made me able to um, hold on. Um, one, we I applied for an SBA loan the day they went live. Um, and got a loan right away. So we're set for at least the next year um, because we, I manage our money very conservatively. Um, and if you're an agency that lives on your margins, um, you have to get checks in to pay your bills and pay your staff, you're not going to survive if you don't have any capital. And the loan I got from the government allows me to 
pay my staff and pay my rent so that way we're not hand to mouth. Um, and it's taken a lot of the pressure off. The uh, agencies that won't survive are the ones that um, counted on their, didn't apply for SBA loans or didn't get them or um, were aren't able to pay their rent without dipping into their, um, you know, uh, staff funds. And, and that's never been an issue. And, and I think part of that is just, you know, being a lawyer and having a good sense of what it takes to keep a business open, I guess. Oh, perfect segue. Yes, you are a lawyer. Uh, you, uh, you're, you went to Georgetown. So this whole Writers Guild agency battle that's been going on must be pretty interesting to you. I mean, even I mean, you're as an agent and a, owning an agency, it's probably very interesting. But from a legal perspective, do, where do you see it going? Right now, it seems like one by one, these big agencies are kind of finally uh, bending to the will of the WGA to some degree. Uh, where do you see that going, or how that's playing out? Well, I honestly. Um... We became a uh, Writers Guild franchised after the fight started. Uh, um, we, I hired Diane uh, and got WGA franchised in like July or August of last year. And so it's been a little over a year that we've had a literary department. And um, I totally understand this from the writer's perspective. The idea that the agent is packaging and taking back end points. I mean, the, the agency is making out terrific, um, but maybe at the expense of the writer. The problem is the reverse of that is that the agency makes no money. So let's say hypothetically, I sell um, a script on behalf of my client for $100,000. And I negotiate that they get back end of, you know, 3%. Uh, we walk away with like 10 grand and the writer gets $90,000 plus 3% on the back end that we'll take 10% of. But we don't make very much money. We have to sell an enormous volume to break even. And that's frustrating. There should be some middle ground. The, the reverse of that is, packaging and I get back end and I'm taking a per percentage from the writer. And I mean, the, the reverse of that is the agent makes out incredibly. So there has to be somewhere in the middle. And I think that's what the agencies are fighting about. And I'm not totally unsympathetic to their position uh, as someone who pays a literary agent who doesn't make um, as much money as the department costs. So it it is sort of a balancing act and it it is has been very difficult to make that department successful because it is expensive to have an office in LA and it's expensive to you know keep the lights on and the phones on so i i get where these agencies are coming from yeah and you have to you know bring on the writers and then hope one of them gets a big hit so that you know it can kind of carry you uh forward as you develop more writers I just wanted to say before I forget that I think the fact that the, there is an animation guild, animated writers guild that is separate from the writers guild is really unfair to the writers of animated series who are writers. And there is the fact that they don't have the same kind of bargaining power as the WGA is really quite unfortunate and we should do something about that the the animated maters guild uh, the animated writers guild should really be part of the writers guild and and i i find a lot of frustration in my friends who are write for animated shows who don't have the same kind of protections that the wga has for their writers oh yeah we'd probably agree with that and i i think recently i think the simpsons was it the simpsons finally got uh, wga recognized so it's starting with the big shows, but it's probably going to, you know, not be universal yet. Um, that actually brings up a good question. I was thinking about voiceover as far as um, as talent from the talent side. Is is that booming right now from for for I mean, we talked about it a little bit, but 
is it over, is it overflowing, I guess, or is, are, are the uh, agents doing voiceover uh, overwhelmed with the people who are submitting because everyone thinks that's where the work is now? I have seen an uptick in actors submitting for voiceover representation, but not so much that it's overwhelming. And I have seen more roles on breakdown services or on the actor side, actors access, the number of roles, um, the number of projects that are voiceover, the number of animated projects has increased, but it's not so much that it's too much for a, a voiceover agent to manage. And there's still opportunities there for people who are interested in submitting. So Absolutely. But I would say the one thing that a, a voiceover actor needs to do is sign up for Source Connect uh, Standard or Pro. That is how all of the sessions are, not all, but the majority of sessions are being run is through Source Connect. And it's an absolute requirement for the majority of the breakdowns I see is they say must have Source Connect Pro or Standard. Can't have Source Connect now, the free version. So what would it look like, I mean, specifically for writing, but really any, uh, any of your clients in any of your categories, when you take on someone to develop them, what does that partnership look like? Like time and what do you want to see happen so you know they're going in the right direction? Just like talk us through the process. So the the first thing that happens is someone will send us a, a treatment or a, you know a log line or the breakdown of the first two seasons of their show, and we have to see potential in there. It has to be something that is developable. Developable. That's I don't know if that's a word. I've made it up. Um, and it has to be original. And it doesn't have to be, I mean, what what we don't want to see is something where the IP is owned by someone else. You know, like Batman, the later years, um, you know, that's not, we're never going to get the IP for Batman. So, you know, if if that's, if you have a great idea for something, but it's based on a, a famous IP, you might want to rethink that because um, it, it's unlikely that we're going to be able to get the rights to it. Um, so in, unless it's something that is over 100 years old, old like Sherlock Holmes, um, where the IP after 100 years, the copyright expires and it becomes public domain. So everyone can use the character of Sherlock Holmes. Um, so there's a little interesting fact for you. Um, after 100 years, your copyright expires. Yes. Yeah. Which is um, uh, sad. But, you know, if you're 112 years old. I would take I would take that case if you're going to fight for your IP. I would take that case. Um, I don't do an intellectual property law. Uh, that is not my field. Um, but uh, some days it's like, yeah, that's a good case. Uh, lawyers uh, get kind of nerd out about law things. Um, good ones, anyway. Um, so we we get your idea. And um, what will happen is we'll sort of talk you through, okay, what's your plan for these characters? What would be your plan for a sequel? What's, if you have an idea for a television show, I need to know how season two ends. If you haven't thought that far ahead, then you're not ready. The idea is not ready. It, it's not fully baked. What we really need is a full... Um, arc you know you don't want characters that are caricatures either every person has flaws every person has um you know redeeming qualities even the you know most terrible human being on the planet has at least one redeeming quality you don't want your villains to be one-dimensional and you don't want your heroes to be one-dimensional and so you know some of the the editing process will be us sending back notes that say you know there's nothing redeeming about this guy i mean hitler loved animals even the worst villain has something about them that you go okay because humans are like that I don't know if that makes any sense. It does. Yeah. It does. It's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot to, to think about. It's a lot to process. It's cool to hear it from the agent's perspective because that's stuff that they don't tell us when we're, you know, pitching. Yeah. And also when you when I get a script, if I'm not engaged in the first 30 pages, I'm not going to keep reading. 
Mm-hmm. And it's like it, it's like that with a, a movie. If you're not engaged in the first 30 minutes, you turn it off. So you really have to, or a novel, the first 30 pages of a novel has to have something that hooks you in. Um, and, and it doesn't have to be a giant plot development. It just has to be something about the characters that makes you want to know what's going to happen to them. Because one of the... Um, uh, most enjoyable middle grade series of books that I've been um, uh, enjoying, the uh, Fable Haven series. The first book takes a long time to get somewhere, and but you care about the characters and you're, you know, interested in what happens to them. So you're willing to uh, sit through um, sort of a slow opening, and then the subsequent books, the, it's it starts with a bang. They all sort of go somewhere right away. But the first book. There's a lot of setup that needs to happen. So you have to make it worth the audience's while to to sit through the setup. Very good advice. And speaking of advice, finally, what advice do you have for for creatives right now? Writers, actors, anybody? What what should they be focusing on? Do it. If you're an actor, act. If you're a writer, write. If you're a singer, sing. Don't wait for the perfect opportunity. Make your own content. This is the perfect opportunity for you to start a podcast. Um, obviously, I'm not telling you guys anything you don't know. You're doing it. <laughs> um, but I, I would say that the, the smartest thing you can do is invest in your craft. Um, one of the biggest mistakes I see with writers with great ideas is they'll spend Five years, and I'm speaking from personal experience because I've been working on a a, a novel series for the last decade, um, at least. Um, Spend five years doing research and storyboarding and not actually writing. And you can make all the excuses in the world, but when if you love to do something, just do it and worry about the audience and the market for it later. Um, We can edit too much writing down. More is better. Um, What I hate is to see people who are like, oh, I have this terrific idea, and they pitch you the idea, and it is terrific, but they never get around to actually writing it. Writers write. Do the writing. Make your own material. Make your own opportunities. Don't wait for someone to hand it to you, because that that never happens. And um, also, if you do it yourself, you know you earned it. Get her done. Yep. Cool. <laughs> Terrific. Julia, if people want to find you, how can they find you online? On Twitter, Julia Erzik. On uh, Instagram, Julia Erzik. On Facebook, Julia Erzik. Um, and uh, the our agency is thelibraryagency.com. Don't forget the the. Uh, thelibraryagency.com. There are instructions on how to submit to Diane on the webpage. And also, if you're an actor, there's a way to submit right through the webpage. But I will caution that we're signing writers and we're signing some, a few actors. But quite honestly, I haven't gone into the office um, in six months. Um, So we can't take meetings to sign contracts. So we're taking signing uh, people very rarely and only with... people who have materials ready to go and hit the ground running. This is the perfect time for all of you to do your research before you (laughs) submit. (laughs) Thank you so much, Julia, for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, it was great. We really appreciate it. Thank you. 